today in AP Environmental Science, we're going to be talking about the Earth's interior, and this is again out of Chapter 4, Ecosystems in the Physical Environment. So this unit, we're talking about all those abiotic factors that affect ecosystems. So let's start off with the beginning, or where all of this energy and where Earth really is coming from. So the current um, ideas about this go back to this Big Bang Theory, which says that about 13.7 billion years ago, there was this giant explosion, and then that was followed by a contraction, where everything started to come back together, and that's what formed the universe, the stars, the planets. Um, that was really the source of all the energy that we're still using today, all the energy that our sun has, etc. Uh, the Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago, still a part of that whole Big Bang phenomenon. And that's when the densest areas of those molecules that were gravitating around the sun started to be drawn into the middle of what is now the Earth. So this is kind of a complicated subject, but I want you to pause it here for a second and read through those steps that are on the timeline here and see if you can get a general idea of what we're talking about happening here. Because this is really what's going to form all the things that we're talking about today. Once the Earth is formed, there's some major events that you should know of in the geologic time scale. So these are divided a little bit differently. The largest part um, is called an eon, and it's differentiated by major either geologic events that took place, like continents moving or paleontology paleontological events, um, like mass extinctions, new species coming about, things like that. Um, you can see that after eons, we break it down into eras, and then after eras, it gets broken down further into periods, and then the smallest unit that we're going to really worry about is epochs. So these are all just periods of time um, that you can look at. There are some important events that you should be aware of. Um, it's important to know when we saw the first life on Earth in general. Um, so that was happening in the Precambrian era. And we can see that that's coming before the Cambrian here, again, Precambrian. You should also know when we saw the first land plants, which is in the Silurian period of the Paleozoic era. And then, of course, things like you had dinosaurs and mammals come about in the Triassic period. The Jurassic was really the age of the dinosaurs. And then at the end of that Mesozoic era, we saw a huge mass extinction of dinosaurs, although the reason for that is still under debate. So today we're going to start talking about, you know, modern times, but all of these forces that shape the Earth and have made it the way it is today. So when we're doing this, we need to talk about three major spheres, uh, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the geosphere. And we're going to start off today talking about the geosphere, which is the land, every all the things that it's riding on, so the plate tectonics and the way things fit together with that. Then later in this unit, we're going to go more into the atmosphere, the air, all of the interactions in what surrounds the Earth on the outermost layer, and then we'll go into the hydrosphere with the water cycle after that. The biosphere is going to be the focus of our next unit. That's all the living things, and that's going to interact with all three of these spheres. So if we start talking about the geosphere, that is the main layer of what you think of as the Earth, the land, and the oceans, and things like that. It's located just beneath the atmosphere. Technically, it is beneath the oceans as well. Um, and we have three major parts to this, which I'm sure you've heard of before, the core, the mantle, and the crust. And we can actually look at this and kind of figure out its composition based on some tests that they've been able to do. So we know that it has a solid, solid inner core. And then there's a liquid outer core around that of iron. And then above that, the mantle is kind of a molten magma, a molten rock, so just very hot, liquefied rock, and it slowly hardens as you get to the closer to the crust, um, where it gets cooler. So at some points, it's more molten, and some points, it's more solid. Um, there are a couple layers you should be aware of. The lithosphere is that very outermost crust, and also the very, very upper layer of the mantle. So anything solid, rock, you can usually think of as the lithosphere. And then the asthenosphere is that upper lev level of molten rock in the mantle. So we're going to talk more about the lithosphere and the asthenosphere later today. 
So in order to understand what's going on inside Earth, you really need to understand this concept of a convection current. So convection currents are based on two things, temperature and density. And basically, temperature really is the measure of how fast molecules are moving. So when temperature increases, your molecules speed up. So hot air is moving very, very fast compared to cold air. And when molecules move fast, they bump into each other more, and that's what helps the temperature to increase, is that friction. So they also are going to spread out as they bump into each other more. So hot air is not very dense compared to cold air. The colder something is, the denser it will be. The hotter it is, the less dense it will be. This causes a convection current. As air heats up, it starts to rise because it's getting less dense, and we know that less dense things tend to rise in general. So as it gets less dense and warmer, it rises. Once it gets up high, though, it eventually starts to cool off because there's usually a cooler air mass up here or you're getting up towards space. So it starts to cool, and as it cools, it gets more dense again, and because it's more dense, it falls. So it creates this continuous current of getting less dense and rising as it's warming and cooling, more dense, falling, and that's your convection current. So this is really easy to see happening in a lava lamp. You have the hot lamp down here. The wax that's down here is heating up and spreading out, and as it does so, it's becoming less dense, so it's going to start to rise to the top. Once it gets all the way to the top, it cools off out here, and then it starts to get more dense, and it'll fall back down. So this same process is happening inside the Earth, um, in the mantle, and particularly in that area we call the asthenosphere, that upper mantle right under the solid crust. Um, so when we see this happening, we get these convection currents going, and there's many going at once, as you can see. And these, again, are happening in that asthenosphere, but they start to push the the lithosphere, that solid crust around. And those, p what we call plates, those pieces of rock in the lith lithosphere um, are going to ride on these currents. And that causes all of the movement that we see in the plates. And when we talk about continental drift, that's really the cause of it. So if those two convection currents are going towards each other, that is going to cause continents or plates to move towards each other as well. If those convection currents are pushing away from each other, then that will push the plates on top of them away from each other, and that will make the continents drift apart. So this leads to the different types of boundaries we see between plates. One of those types is called a divergent boundary. So you can see with these convection currents, they are moving away from each other. And because of that, they're pushing the crust that's on top of them away from each other. So as you push two plates away from each other, you get kind of this empty area in the middle. So new crust has to form since these things are being pushed away. And that happens when the magma upwells and this is happening at the mid-ocean ridge in the middle of the Atlantic right now. Magma is coming up from the mantle and forming brand new seafloor. So this is called seafloor spreading. So that's a divergent boundary. So I like to kind of think of this as what would happen also if you had some blocks in a pot of water that was boiling. You also have a convection current going on in that water. So if you get two opposite convection currents, it's going to push the blocks away from each other. And it's the same thing that's happening here. And then water's going to bubble up in the middle. Same thing happens only when molten rock bubbles up in the middle, it starts to solidify when it hits that cold water. Then we have a convergent boundary. In this case, the plates are moving towards each other instead of away because, again, the convection currents are moving towards each other. So two things can happen here. If this happens between two continental plates, you actually get a mountain range because the two continental plates are so thick that they collide and they make a mountain range. But what's more common is that this will happen between an oceanic plate and a continental plate. And when that happens, the ocean oceanic crust, the one under the ocean, is much thinner. So it subducts, or in other words, it dives underneath the continental plate. And when it 
does that, it forms what we call a subduction zone. And these subduction zones are really prime spots to have earthquakes happen because the crust is scraping against each other. They also, because as this crust dives down here, it starts to melt, they can a lot of times have volcanoes along them as well. I want you to notice that even at these subduction zones, you still usually have mountain ranges pop up. So you see this in places like the west coast of North America, where you have those Cascade Mountains along the California coast. And then you have that subduction zone right off of the coast. So here's just a um, little diagram that kind of shows you all three. Um, Oh, we didn't talk about transform. Sorry, transform boundaries, on the other hand, are when the plates slide past each other. So instead of the convection currents either pushing them towards each other or away, they are pushing them in a direction that they're going to slide in opposite directions from each other. So when they slide past each other, you get lots of earthquakes. The San Andreas Fault is probably the most famous of these transform boundaries, and a lot of times you can see what's happening in the Earth. This results in valleys and places where the Earth really erodes down the middle of where these two plates are passing. So now that, that brings us to our little diagram here. We have a couple different types of zones here. Here's your subduction zone. So this is two convergent plates coming together. Um, and then you have a divergent boundary here where we're having seafloor spreading and a ridge forming. And then you have a transform plate boundary here. You can see they don't connect, but they're sliding past each other um, in that direction. So these are some examples of where you might find these on Earth. You can see that there are in general some convergent boundaries whenever you have two plates moving at each other and whenever they're moving away from each other you're going to get those divergent. So a lot of times along these boundaries you will have earthquakes and an earthquake basically happens when two plates scrape against each other and build up a lot of stress and then all of a sudden they break free and that stress is released as seismic waves. So an earthquake actually originates from what we call the focus deep underground and then there is a point called the epicenter directly above that on ground which would be like the city or the area that uh, it affects the most. Um, there are some other effects of, lands, of earthquakes you should be aware of. Landslides are caused by earthquakes, by tectonic movement, and tsunamis, big waves that are caused by underwater earthquakes that can cause a lot of damage. We also see a major pattern of volcanoes popping up around these plates. So you can kind of look and see all of the different volca major volcanoes and where they pop up, and you should start to see a pattern here. So most volcanoes occur along those subduction zones where one plate is diving under the other one. But some are going to occur along the mid-Atlantic ridge, all, any of those spreading zones as well. And then you have some that aren't associated with plates. So if we go back to this map, I want you to notice, okay, here are some of our mid-Atlantic ridge, those divergent um, plate boundary volcanoes, but then you have these random ones that are kind of out in the middle of plates. And those form because of hot spots. And there's some disagreement on what causes a hot spot exactly, but basically you have these areas in the mantle that are hotter than other areas, and for whatever reason, the magma starts to come up from below, and it breaks through the crust, and it forms these hot spot volcanoes, which tend to be a little bit different than other types of volcanoes. So here again, you have a picture that kind of shows you some of the different boundaries here. And in this case, they've taken out the volcanoes that are on the convergent, divergent boundaries where we would normally expect them. And these are just showing you the major hot spots in the world that you should be aware of. All right, so in class tomorrow, we're going to take uh, this idea of plate tectonics and do a little activity with it. Uh, so just make sure you are prepared and you are aware of all your vocabulary and things from tonight. Great, I'll see you tomorrow.